of you remember this news headline from back in October. You may remember this. Christmas is at risk due to supply chain problems. You may remember that headline? That kind of dominated the news for a little bit. So what do you think of that headline when you heard it? Christmas is at risk due to supply chain problems. My first reaction was this. If you really think that Christmas is at risk due to supply chain problems, you really don't understand the true meaning of Christmas. Okay? I guess if Christmas was simply all about giving presents and receiving presents, then that distorted understanding of Christmas could be at risk. If Christmas is all about you shopping at the stores until you find the perfect gift for your loved ones, then I guess that kind of Christmas could be at risk because of supply chain problems. How can you even celebrate Christmas this year when the gifts for your loved ones are on back order? Because they're sitting on one of those shipping containers waiting to be delivered to the store. You know? So did we just cancel Christmas? Should I get the elders together and say, boy, guess we had to cancel this year. Just can't do it. Supply chain problems. You know, hopefully you're here today preparing for Christmas and you're not worried about supply chain problems because you have a God who has promised to supply all of your true needs in the person of Jesus Christ. So somehow I think we need to get back to the real meaning of Christmas. You know, I think we find ourselves agreeing with that great theologian Charlie Brown when he asks the question, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Many of you remember that his question comes from the classic TV show called The Charlie Brown Christmas. That show's been airing since 1965, so think about it. That's been over 50 years it's been on there. That's a pretty good run, especially for a cartoon that was produced on a low budget and was thrown together at the last minute. It all came about when Coca-Cola came looking for a Christmas special to sponsor for holiday marketing. And the cartoon Peanuts was extremely popular, so they asked for a meeting and a few ideas. So Peanuts creator Charles Schultz and the producers threw together an outline in just one day. And the Coca-Cola leaders went for it. But Charles Schultz had a few unorthodox ideas. He wanted a jazz soundtrack, and he wanted to make sure there was no laugh track. All the shows in that time period made use of a laugh track. But Charles Schultz didn't want them. And most importantly, Schultz insisted that the true Christmas story had to be presented complete with a scene read straight from the Bible on national TV. And the TV producers worried that that would be way too controversial to read the Bible on national TV. But Schultz insisted on it. And it might have been controversial at the time, but I think you could say that show's done pretty well. And if you've seen the show a time or two, then you remember that Charlie Brown is surrounded by all the trappings of Christmas. And they just come up empty for him. He looks at all the stuff and like, isn't there more to Christmas than this stuff? And when he wonders aloud what Christmas is really about, his best friend Linus sets him straight with a clear answer straight from Luke chapter 2. Linus recites this passage of scripture in this classic scene from television history. And I'm going to read it from the King James Version, just like Linus did. Luke 2, verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So Charlie Brown discovered hope in those words that he heard from Luke chapter 2. He goes from being depressed to being encouraged. 
So today I invite you to hear those same words of hope as we enter into the season of Advent. Over the next few weeks, we're going to focus on God's perfect gift. And when you think about buying gifts for your loved ones, some people spend a lot of time just looking for that perfect gift. If you love someone and you know them really well, then you have a pretty good idea of what they need and what they don't need. You know, if I wanted to give a gift to Luke Walbriff, I thought about it, I really shouldn't go buy him a hairbrush. <laughs> you know, I've asked Luke, and he told me I've got way too many hairbrushes. <laughs> But you know, if you know people and you know what they really want, then you find that perfect gift. Well, guess what? God loves us. He created us. He knows us extremely well. And he knows what you really need. And he knows what I really need. And that's why he sent Jesus. And the Apostle Paul was so overwhelmed by this gift of Jesus that he wrote these words in 2 Corinthians. He said, thanks be to God for his what? indescribable gift. Paul basically says, you know, when I think about how amazing this gift of Jesus is, words just fail me. This gift is indescribable. So as we go through this season of Advent leading up to Christmas, we're going to look at this perfect gift that God gave. We're going to see why Jesus is really just what we need. So let's back up and just take a minute. What exactly is Advent? The word Advent means coming or arrival, and the season of Advent is marked by things like expectation and waiting and anticipation, longing. When we think back to the Old Testament, we remember how God's people, what did they do? They longed for the promised Messiah to come. We can celebrate the birth of the coming of Jesus, and now we can long for the day when Jesus will come again in triumph. There's a few differences in how people celebrate the Advent season, but the core is the same. One of the common traditions of Advent is the lighting of candles on the Advent wreath. And that circular wreath represents God's unending love for us. And the lighting of the candles, what do you think that signifies? That reminds us that Jesus came to a world that was lost in darkness. Jesus was the light of the world. We were lost in darkness. God's gift to us. Isaiah put it this way. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has gone. So this Christmas season can be very hectic and busy as we try to get everything done on our list. But the season of Advent invites us to take a step back and prepare our hearts for the coming of Jesus. We're invited to focus on a story that's far greater than our own story. It's a story of God sending the perfect gift to save people he loves, you and me. So no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you can prepare your heart for God's perfect gift. And over the next few weeks of Advent, we're gonna see how God met our deepest needs when he gave us the perfect gift of Jesus Christ. And today we're going to focus on the hope that we find in Jesus. So what do we mean when we talk about hope? If you listen to people in everyday conversations, how do they use that word? You might hear things like, I hope it doesn't rain. I hope I get that job I applied for. I hope my in-laws will get along this year at Christmas. I hope the surgery goes well. Sure hope the Packers lose. <laughs> I hope my favorite politician wins the election. You know, when you look at all these statements about hope, they seem to have, seem to have something in common. The world's kind of hope is characterized by doubt and uncertainty. We hope for things that might or might not happen. Yeah, might win, might not. Who knows? Might happen, might not. But the hope we find in Jesus Christ is different. Christians have a solid hope in Jesus. We have an unshakable hope because Jesus has conquered the grave. I think we can appreciate this gift of hope if we think about our hope in the past, in the present, and in the future. So let's start with hope from the past. What's the longest that you've ever had to wait for something? Think about that. 
you're waiting and waiting and waiting. What's the longest you ever had to wait for something? Maybe you can think back to your childhood. You had your heart set on a certain gift that was going to bring you so much joy at Christmas. So you waited and you hoped and you waited and you hoped. I'm guessing some of you can remember that very clearly. It's like Christmas Day would never come. In the Old Testament, God's people knew a lot about waiting. It seems that their entire history was marked by waiting as they looked forward to the day that this promised Messiah was going to come and set them free. The Old Testament has some prophecies about this Messiah. Isaiah 7, the Lord himself will give you a sign the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Then two chapters later, Isaiah 9, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government, government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So let's remember these prophecies were made hundreds of years before Jesus came as the promised Messiah. People had a solid promise from a solid God. But that didn't make waiting any easier. When we think about hope in the present, I think it's helpful to look at this from the perspective that Mary would have had. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary, tells her about the coming of Jesus. Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he's going to reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary? He asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to be, be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Wow. <laughs> Can you imagine what Mary had to do with? When we find ourselves faced with some of the really big questions in life, I think we sometimes think, wouldn't it be great if God would just send an angel and tell us what we should expect? Wouldn't it be so much easier if we would just know the future? Well, maybe yes and maybe no. In Mary's case, maybe it would have been easier for her not to know. What do you do when you're given information from the angels, like from the angel like that? She had to respond to this information that she was just given. She still had to place her trust in God. She still had to place her hope in God. So today, in our present situation, we've been given solid information from God's Word and solid promises from God's Word. But just like Mary, we still have to respond to this information. Just like Mary, we need to place our trust in God. We need to place our hope in God. So today, in your present situation, you might be facing a big storm in some very difficult circumstances. Satan might be trying to flood your mind with worry and stress. In the midst of your storm, will you still hold on to hope? As you look to the future, you might not see any indication that things are going to get better. So how do you hold on to hope in your present circumstances? Well, let's remember that just because you can't see any change that is happening 
That doesn't mean that God is still not working behind the scenes to bring good out of a difficult situation. God might be working in other people. God might be working inside of you to shape your character, even though it might be very painful at the time. And even though you might not see any signs of positive change, remember these words from the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 6, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Our present hope in Jesus doesn't stop the storms of life. It doesn't change the immediate situations we face. But like an anchor holds a ship steady against the wind and the waves, our hope holds us firm and secure in the middle of life's storms. And then finally, we have a hope for the future. While our focus leading up to Christmas is, of course, on the birth of Jesus and his coming to the world, you know, Advent is also about the future. Advent's not just about preparing your hearts for Christmas. It's also about preparing your heart so you're ready for that day when Jesus will come again. And you might find that waiting patiently for the second coming of Jesus is even harder than waiting for Christmas. We long for the time when everything's going to be restored and made new. The pain and suffering of today is very real. But we hold on to the future hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans. Romans 8, he said, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So Paul just described the future hope that we have as Christians. We wait for it patiently. Are you a patient waiter? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. So as we think about applying today's message, I think we need to think about accepting God's gift of hope. That's where it starts. Hope is a gift, but it's got to be accepted. It's got to be received. Later in the book of Romans, Paul tells us how our lives can overflow with this hope. Chapter 15, he writes, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So notice, God is referred to as the God of hope. And if you want your life to overflow with hope, then... How does that happen? What do you need to do? Paul says it will happen as you trust in him. You choose to trust the God of hope, and then he's going to fill your life with hope. Jesus is the perfect gift, but you have to accept this gift that God has for you. We have a present hope now. We're told to wait patiently for our future hope. So as Christians, we wait and we hope. We wait, and we hope. We wait patiently. So where do you find it the most difficult right now in your life for you to wait? When is waiting the hardest? When is it the hardest? It seems that we go through, as we go through life, we can find ourselves just getting placed in different waiting rooms in life. We wait patiently when a loved one is struggling with physical health problems. And we wait patiently when a loved one is struggling with mental health problems. We wait patiently as we pray and we wait for a loved one to surrender and give his life to Jesus. We wait patiently as we battle loneliness. We wait patiently to see our loved ones again as we work through the painful grief of losing them. I've been with people in some of these waiting rooms of life, and I don't know how many times I've heard a Christian say, how does anyone face this pain without the hope of Jesus Christ in their life? 
how does anyone face what I'm going through without the hope that comes from Jesus Christ? So if you've never accepted Jesus as and the hope that he offers, you need to accept him today because you don't want to go through life facing anything without him. You need the hope that Jesus offers. All of us need that hope. So God calls us to receive his gift of hope and then to share his gift of hope with others. We believe that everyone needs hope. So who do you know who needs the hope of Jesus in their life today? And then what can you do to help them find this solid hope that Jesus offers? Okay, if you found Jesus, if you have the hope that Jesus offers, do you know somebody in your life right now who doesn't know Jesus? And they don't have the same hope that you do? All right then, what can we do? We've received it. What can we do now to share that with other people? Just think of the joy that's going to come into their life if they can find Jesus. So with everything we look at this Advent series, it's going to be receive it yourself, but then make sure you're going to share it because there's so many people that don't have it yet. Okay? Receive and share. So let's apply this to a struggle that's very common in our world. And I'm thinking about how many people in our world struggle with loneliness. Okay? Study after study says that this is getting worse and worse. Many people struggle with loneliness. And this just isn't a problem here in the United States. Japan has been struggling with suicide rates that have been rising, so they actually appointed a minister of loneliness. Do you know that? A minister of loneliness. This person in this new position is supposed to try and reduce loneliness and social isolation among the people. During just the month of October during 2020, more Japanese people died from suicide than had died from COVID during all of 2001. So think about that. That's how much loneliness and despair there is in people's lives. Studies show that loneliness has been linked to a higher risk of health issues like heart disease, dementia, eating disorders. People in Japan have worked to try to solve this problem of loneliness in several different ways. Get this. One company designed a robot to hold someone's hand when they're lonely. Another man charges people to simply come and sit with them and do nothing except keep them company. So you think God is happy with these solutions for loneliness? You know, I think God might have a few better ideas than creating a robot or charging people for you to spend time with them. Okay? He has something called the church. All right? You and me. <laughs> Don't need robots. Don't need to charge people to go spend time with them. The church just needs to be the church. Okay? So maybe you look at this problem of loneliness and suicide and you think, well, God could never use me to tackle such a big problem. I don't have the right education. I don't have the training. I mean, that suicide stuff's a big issue. You know what? I think if you have a heart of compassion, God can use you to point people to the hope they can find in Jesus Christ. Okay? I think all it takes is a heart of compassion. And then God can use you to point people to the hope that they can find in Jesus Christ. I read this story about a man named Don Ritchie. He lived near a place called The Gap, which is an ocean cliff in, in Sydney. It's a very popular visitor destination because of its beauty. But... It's also become a well-known suicide spot over the years. It's estimated that about 50 people end their lives there every single year. They just go and they look over the cliff and they contemplate, should I jump? And then 50 people a year commit suicide there. Don lived near this site and over the years he has stopped at least 160 people from killing themselves. The real number is closer to 400 people according to his family. So as individuals walked up to the cliff looking at the crashing waves below and wondering whether they should jump, Don would approach them with a smile and he'd say, you know, why don't you come and have a cup of tea with me? And many individuals accepted his offer. And then they would be invited into his home where they would have a nice 
visited over a cup of tea. There was no counseling, no advising, no prying into their business. It was simply one human being lending a listening ear to another. Some of these people had mental health problems, some had medical illnesses, some people were simply going through a really rough patch in life. But many of them, that listening ear was exactly what they needed as they changed their minds about jumping after visiting with him over a cup of tea. So who would have thought that a simple visit over a cup of tea could be so powerful? You know, I like that story because this man didn't have any specialized training. He just had a compassionate heart and a listening ear. Every day you and I can be walking by people who are on the verge of throwing in the towel and giving up. But as Christian, God want, as Christians, God wants us to offer love and a listening ear to people. And God can use you and me to help people find this perfect gift. So today's challenge is pretty simple, but important. Receive God's gift of hope. Share God's gift of hope. Receive and share. Receive and share. It's something we can all do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that Jesus is the perfect gift. You are just so amazing when you looked at us and you knew exactly what we needed. So thank you, Lord, for the solid, unshakable hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I praise you that Jesus has conquered the grave. I praise you that Jesus is coming again. Oh, I praise you that Jesus is preparing a place for us in heaven. So, Lord, in the meantime, please help us to share this hope with people who are still in darkness. Lord, there's so much joy waiting for people when they can find Jesus. Help us to be the church. Help us to do what you want us to do. And we just pray that more and more people will find the hope that Jesus offers. We pray this in Jesus' name.